This is a huge machine. It's amazing how many people it takes to put on a violent society competition. We have a trade show, the lecture series. What was the family business? And I'm going to look mainly at overall output of instruments. It's something that has been mostly ignored. And we have a competition, and of course the competition takes the most bodies to make that work. The last competition we had competitors from over 17 countries. We do have quite a, a variation in terms of age. There's getting to be a greater percentage of female makers within the profession. We have people in this competition that uh, maybe they made their first instrument and they've had the guts to stick it out on the table and, and there are other makers that have competed many times and they've either right at the cusp of winning something or they're almost at that point where they've gotten their, their last gold medal. Well, the competition is for instruments and bows uh, in the bow category. We have a separate competition for violin, viola, cello, and bass bows. And the same for instruments, you know, violin, viola, cello, bass, as well as string quartet. So within one competition, there's essentially about 10 competitions going on. We have a set of three judges which review all instruments and bows. I thought it was much difficult uh, as a start to judge uh, uh, such a high number of instruments, but then uh, when they told us what was the purpose, the way in which uh, the judgment was to be done, uh, it was quite easy in the end, because the first round was simply to cut off uh, the instruments where, where, which were uh, was considered to be the best. The most important was the general uh, look. My way was that I went through them all, only putting marks for this general impression first. The idea is that an instrument is not just made by simple parts all put together, but an instrument is a wall going up in the hands of the maker who's making it. And I think we all agree on the fact that this is how instruments should be looked at in such a competition like this. My role here was to be a tone judge for the competition. I'm supposed to go and try each viola and irrespective of the way it looks, just pick it up, play it and try to draw the best sound I possibly can out of it in a lot of different situations. I know that a lot of people will come and they'll try instruments and they'll just kind of play as loudly as they possibly can. But for me, I like to go to an instrument, like look at all these amazing instruments here, and, and just kind of listen for the quality and, and see how receptive the instrument is to accepting music from a player. I was pretty impressed. It was a tough competition. People are studying, they're listening, they're, they're working hard, and they're understanding where the needs are for violists. You can be a well-known professional with many, many years experience, or you can actually enter the first violin you've ever made. And so there's an entire learning curve along that process, and we have all, all variations in between. There are a few interesting violins which make it particularly difficult for the judges. I think there was one which was uh, made from carbon fiber, also one which uh, was made from a coconut shell. Um, they were interesting to look at, but obviously different enough from a traditional violin, which kept them from winning the war, though.
this. Yeah. Right, I don't have that one checked off. Okay. Um, and you're going to sign it that you agree with what's there, then you, and then Fong. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's going to meet some happy people. There's a lot of nervousness leading up to the competition because there can be only a few award winners. is awarded to Andrew Ryan. think about the odds, in a category of violin we had about 250 instruments, I think 246 to be exact. This was at the very top percentage by both the workmanship and the tone judges, which is uh, it's quite a feat. Uh, I'm Jeff Phillips and I'm here at uh, VSA Violin Making Competition and uh, where I've been lucky enough to win uh, double gold for the violin category. This is my fifth uh, competition, uh, VSA competition that I've entered. So it's been, uh, it's been a progress. You know, you come to these things and you learn so much every time about what they're looking for and what makes a better instrument and uh, slowly kind of work your way up. It's a Stradivari modeled instrument. Uh, made a copy of Strad's G form and then made an instrument off of that. So it's not a copy of a specific instrument that he made, but uh, off of the mold. Uh, so I'm hoping for it to have a lot of Stradivari influence, uh, but also have some of my own characteristics as well. You know, I think that uh, at, at some point the differences are getting so small between what we're doing today and what was done then that, uh, you know, as an organic piece of wood, you know, 300 years of time does something to it that uh, we'll just never have necessarily as, uh, as a modern new instrument. Uh, exactly what that is at this point, I'm not so sure. Uh, some people uh, have their own ideas on that. Um, but again, I think, uh, I think we're coming so close sound-wise that at some point it's going to become irrelevant. We're in a pretty amazing time right now with violin making. I think uh, we're at a pretty high level. Um, are we there yet with the old uh, golden period instruments from Cremona? I'm not sure yet. It's, uh, we're close. We're very, very close. I still think that there is an edge that they have that we, maybe we don't quite have yet, but uh, we're really close. There's lots of artsy students out there. They were always involved in woodworking, metalworking, but you know they're still mu musicians and now they're saying, hey, I can take my love of music and combine it with my artsy side and they're really just, you know, some of the results have been phenomenal.
When they walk in the vendor room, it's like the biggest candy store ever. It's a toy store. So there's tools and wood and they get to hand select products. Being in the vendor room alone, there's so much there that you want to buy, but you just, you got to kind of hold back. But one day, I'd like to be able to buy many of the things that I've seen so far. Um, yeah, one day I'd like to come in with just a box and fill it up and then just the buy box. that. Yeah. Buy that, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as luthiers and bow makers, we kind of seclude ourselves and we work on our own a lot. Uh, sure, we may have friends, but a lot of our friends live across the country or different, different areas, countries. different countries altogether, yeah. So, you know, conferences like the VSA or Federation conferences, um, kind of the only place that you get to see those good friends of yours again. And it's kind of the melding of the minds for all of us, you know, where we get the best ideas for, you know, everything we're trying to do here. One unique feature about the VSA competition is that we want to try to give as much one-on-one -on -one feedback between the judge and, and the participant. That's good. We always want musicians to attend because if you're an instrument maker or a bow maker, um, the instrument is not going to sound without somebody to perform on it. It's been wonderful to try to not only bring them into the area where the award-winning instruments and bows are featured, but also to try to introduce some topics which are relative to musicians. Uh, one topic which uh, I think has been very interesting was the aspect of the uh, Paris uh, experiment, which included uh, Dr. Claudia Fritz. The question of how does it change, of opinions change from a small to a concert hall is an interesting question. Uh, we agreed that there were limitations to the study because... Um, she introduced a double-blind test with musicians performing on six selected contemporary instruments versus six old Cremonies instruments. This association of price tag and sound and capability in the hall are not so clear anymore. Um, because you can have, and I have tried fiddles that are in the million, million, millions um, that didn't excite me as some of the modern fiddles that I tried in Paris. So we're going to end with uh, more music and uh, uh, Chou Lan Lin will be playing the slow movement from the Ravel Sonata, the blues movement, and uh, the pianist is uh, Rohan Da Silva, one of the uh, official pianists for the Indianapolis competition. So let's welcome Mr. Lin and Mr. DeSelva.
that the school then used with is his own uh, Titian strat. Uh, which one was that first? Sorry. Which which was the Titian strat? Your own instrument that you played the first. My own, but the first violin. The first one. The first and the last one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and uh, let me explain uh, the, the other violin. Um, uh, during the auction yesterday, uh, Mr. Lin had about half an hour with the four medal winners of our competition. And uh, so he decided to play um, Colin Gallagher's gold medal winning violin. Do you want to explain your experience, the half hour experience? Oh, I, I love them all. Um, and uh, I felt just a more, a uh, little bit more comfort um, with the, how to produce the sound. Because you know, I knew I was not going to get to the violin again until maybe 30 minutes before this um, uh, event was going to start, so the, the time to get to know an instrument was extremely limited. So I just picked one that felt the most natural. But as I think, as it turned out, uh, Colin used a, a 1735 Plowden Del Jesu as a model, which is a model that I know well because I have a Sam Sigmatovich based on the exact same violin. And uh, so I think maybe that's why I instinctively felt more comfortable with this, uh, both the setup and, and the dimension of the violin. But I have to just, again, say I was given four violins to choose. I love them all. Okay. Well, bravo to our, our, our makers. Part of the mission for the Violin Society is to educate. And, you know, every year we hold this great scholarship auction. And this year they raised a ton of money, and that money goes back to the students to pay for their violin making schools. Okay, everybody, can we begin to clear the stage so that we can begin the auction, please? Keep in mind that everything which is auctioned off uh, this afternoon, with the exception of the Steinway, which is <laughs> not available, uh, will go to the benefit of the VSA scholarship auction. Who lost out on the loss? Oh, how about 80? Who start us off at 80? Okay, 80, I've got 90 where? 80, looking for 90 and 100. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, are, are you guys together? I've got 200, say 225 now, 225 and 250 and 275. I know how important it is to the students at the school. Uh, I have a, a certificate that we've made up for this bow. This is out of my private collection. I made this bow and I set it aside because I like it so much I wanted to keep it, but I'm gonna let you have it today. So, thank you very much. At 34 now, say $3,500, we've got a dealer and an end user. Think about it, $3,500 and $3,750. <laughs> We, we received over $26,000 this year, so that, that will be very good. Over the years, the Violin Society has provided uh, over $250,000 uh, for, for scholarship money. The violin world, the new making of violins and bows is really alive and well, and this, this competition really, really proves that. I heard somebody say today, between 1975 and 2025, it's going to go down in history as really, you know, just this upward uh, swing for violin makers. There couldn't be a better time as now to be a maker. Just look at this hall in this beautiful hotel. We have hundreds of violins here for a whole week. Um, that's just uh, historically, we live in our dream. 
this is an amazing thing where people come and put their work out in this room. The table's full of instruments. Uh, they put their best foot forward. There's just so much in there to learn. Uh, I mean, these events here have without a doubt made me a better violin maker. So.